So Dr. Emma Chambers has previously done two years working in oil and gas seismic processing at IOM Geophysical between 2014 and 2016. She then went on to complete a PhD at the University of Southampton, where she studied using seismic waves to image melt migration pathways and storage between the Northern East African Rift. After finishing her PhD in July 2020, she went on to start a postdoc at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, where she is currently part of the DIG project, which stands for De-Risking Islands Geothermic Potential, which is what she will be talking about today. So, Emma, uh, please start sharing your screen and take it away. Cool. Thanks for the introduction, Sebastian. Um, just do another double check that you guys can all see this. Yeah, we can. Cool, perfect. So, yep, I'm Emma, postdoc at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, and I'm going to talk to you about low enthalpy geothermal energy in Ireland and the DIG project. And should note that it's a very collaborative effort between many different institutions, people, and using different techniques, which hopefully I'll get across to you in this presentation. So I thought I'd start with an overview of geothermal energy, then move on to kind of Irish applications, because that's what I'm studying, and then move on to um, the DIG projects, the different work packages, and then specifically what I'm working on. So first of all, what is geothermal energy? Well, it's essentially thermal heat rising from the Earth's interior, and we have two main sources for this heat. We have heat rising from the center of the Earth um, mantle, and the center of the Earth is around 5,000 degrees Celsius, and the heat rises to the surface accounting for about 50% of all heat production. We also have heat production from radioactive decay of natural elements. Granites in particular often result in areas of elevated thermal temperatures. And we've known about these technology, this heat source for quite a long time. So as in this example um, on the right here, this is the Roman baths in Bath in the UK. And this is not an area of renown for its volcanoes. In contrast to the Kraftler geothermal power station in Iceland, um, which is a very volcanic region and um, where we've got high um, geothermal potential. But you can see it happens in both regions. So um, does, where does this the geothermal energy located. Now, I should also say the geothermal gradient is just the gradual change in temperature from Earth's um, surface to the core. And in continental settings, this is typically about 25 degrees Celsius per one kilometer of depth, as shown in the right-hand figure. But we do have other areas that have elevated um, temperature gradients. And often when we think of geothermal systems, we think of somewhere uh, volcanic, such as similar to Iceland, and this uh, figure of the Blue Lagoon. But recent studies of the temperature gradient show that pretty much anywhere on Earth, we have sufficient temperature gradients for geothermal energy extraction. But, and one example of this, if uh, this works, oh, a bit blurry, but yeah, is um, in Ireland at the Mallow Warm Springs. Um, this is an area of uh, a warm spring at about 19 degrees Celsius. Um, so it's not hot, but, it doesn't freeze in the winter, so we have a potential heat source here. So, yeah. So, but it could be sufficient for heating in a low enthalpy geothermal system. The main problem is how do we extract this heat and what will be the cost for this venture? So, let's think about advantages and disadvantages of geothermal energy before we look at an Irish specific example. Now, Firstly, it's a renewable green resource. Um, we're all aware of climate change. We need to um, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. So this is a way that we can sort out the um, sort out this resource. And it's also cheap once we've established this um, energy. Um, just to carry on extracting it. It um, is a continual renewable energy source and it's reliable. It's available 24 seven, unlike wind or solar. Um, when the sun goes down, we don't have access to that. When the wind stops blowing, we have issues, but this is gonna be available 24 seven. And as I've said, it can be used anywhere on earth as an advantage. And we can use it for both for heating, cooling and for electricity um, generation. But that's not the entire story. We do have disadvantages to this. Now, firstly, we have the potential to generate earthquakes when we extract this heat source. 
Um, we've all heard of fracking. Um, many sites are being shut down. And when we drill a borehole to extract geothermal um, heat, um, we can induce seismicity um, just in um, putting in the borehole and also when we put fluids down that. It's also expensive to set this up initially. It might be cheap once it's established, but it's a big investment up front. And it's also location specific. Areas which have higher um, temperature gradients are going to be um, more financially viable for use of this um, energy source. But, and also we need to have it close to the people that are going to use it. It's great if we have a very cheap area to produce it, but if it's not next to the end users, such as heating for people's houses, then is this any good? Maybe we need to look at more storage um, systems. And again, we need to think about sustainable management through pumping and monitoring of infrastructure. These systems can degrade through time, so we need to carry on updating them, monitoring them. And also, if they do degrade, then the fluids that we will be pushing around the system, if they start leaking into the environment, what damage could that cause? And it can be used in all locations, but we can't necessarily have all uses in all locations, such as electricity. We really need very high temperatures. And if we're going to have to drill 10 kilometers depth, that's not financially viable. So we need to work out the costs. So if we look at some applications of geothermal, um, we've got a wide variety, um, including um, heating resources, uh, such as in this example here for individual homes. We can send down some fluids, um, absorb the heat from the ground and bring it back up. And that's great. Um, we can also use the same thing for cooling, instead sending down the warm and discharging the heat and bringing it back up to our houses. We don't just have to do this at a small scale level though, we can do this as district networks for agricultural purposes um, and industri industrial uses. Um, so um, we can scale these up. And we should add that we need to know how hot um, our heat source is. Most applications use geothermal for heat purposes in the form of hot fluids between about 50 degrees Celsius and 150 degrees Celsius. And, the suit and this is the kind of heating. The suitable temperature varies for the different applications. So say we're looking at the agriculture sector, which is a big player in Ireland, then the range of um, temperatures that we want are between about 25 and 90 degrees Celsius. Whereas for heating, maybe we want something more 50 to 100, something a bit more elevated. So if we have um, heat exceeding 150 degrees Celsius, we can use it for electricity generation. Um, and these are usually high enthalpy environments such as Iceland or Kenya. Another use, um, and quite fun, is recreational uses. We have thermal hot springs, and this is what was initially known before we started um, actually extracting, storing it and providing it for houses. So this is one of the original uses. So, if we look at the two um, types of system, I'm going to go through both shallow geothermal systems and also move on to ge deep geothermal systems, firstly focusing on the shallow. And this, for this example, I'm going to show you um, related to homes and um, ground source heat pumps, but we could also do shallow scale for um, more district and industrial purposes. So we have two ways to extract heat um, for shallow geothermal systems. First, we've got this kind of solar energy from the sun, which heats the Earth's surface. And then the second source is heat from deep inside the Earth. Now we can use um, a heat pump to harness the temperature difference between the surface and the ground, um, providing heating, and in some cases, even cooling. So on the left here, um, I show an example of a closed loop system. We have fluid is circulated in a sealed pipe. Um, we send down the um, cold fluid and this is gradually heated up um, within the ground, coming back um, as warm and then transferred as heat to the house. And this shows a horizontal loop, but we could use a vertical loop, um, which will save on space. We don't need to dig up the whole garden, but it will need to go deeper. Or we could even use a slinky loop, which uses a uh, tight, coils um, to heat and move the uh, um, fluids around. Then on secondly, we have open loop systems, um, which um, 
where natural groundwater is pumped to the surface and re-injected. And in some cases, the groundwater, instead of being re-injected, is discharged to streams, rivers, or the sea. And you can see that we pump it down, it comes back up, but these are not connected. So for deep geothermal system, it's where the um, energy source is kind of hot enough again to provide us heat or electricity um, if it's hotter again, and could even if it's hot enough, could generate power through steam driven turbines. Now, deep geothermal methods involve drilling to greater depths than shallow geothermal systems. There's no strict definition here. Um, I think in the UK, they specify deep geothermal as 500 meters, Ireland's it's about 400 meters, but there's no official definition. But basically, we're drilling a lot deeper than this. And we quite often have wells that are one kilometer to about I think in the UK, there's one that's about five kilometers depth. So yeah, but we need to, for deep geothermal, we need to drill to greater depths to harness um, financially viable temperatures. Um, and in most cases, naturally heated groundwater or even steam is pumped to the surface and the heat is extracted. And sometimes we get natural hydrothermal systems where the hot groundwater flows to the surface of its own accord, and these are hot springs. And as I said, these have been used for bathing, cooking, heating for thousands of years. But in some areas, the rock below is still hot, but it's dry. And in these cases, a deep well, often uh, two to five kilometers, drilled down into the rock, cold water is pumped down, and the water passes through the fissures in the rock located here. And then the hot water and steam rise to the surface through another well and used to drive large turbines to generate electricity or for heat. Now, you've probably seen um, lots of examples of um, geothermal extraction, can think of many places, and also research projects. And in some cases, some countries have been producing geothermal energy for decades. Um, two examples of commercial generation are in Iceland and Kenya. I think in Iceland, 85% of Icelandic homes are heated with geothermal energy. Um, and um, I think 27% of all electricity in Ireland comes from geothermal. In fact, their electricity generation is almost 100% renewables re related. So, which is great um, that geothermal can be a contributor in this way. In Kenya, um, in 2020 and 20 to 2021, 48% of all electricity um, generated in the country was from geothermal resources. Um, and this is one of the uh, Kenyan power plants um, produced by Kengen. And again, this is the Kraftler um, geothermal plant. And in fact, in Iceland at this plant, they had a very interesting um, exploration uh, geothermal well was drilled um, about approximately 10 years ago as part of the Iceland deep drilling project. And they struck a pocket of magma at 2,100 meters depth. So. This wasn't great initially, um, striking magma, not usually good. However, they managed to develop a cemented steel case um, in the hole with a perforation at the bottom close to the magma. And the high temperatures and the pressure of the magmatic steam were then used to generate 36 megawatts of electricity, making this the world's first magma enhanced geothermal system. So you can see that we're developing and um, enhancing our geothermal systems through these. However, also, geothermal systems um, now seem to be a viable option in less conventional settings. So, for example, the Utah Forge Project in the US um, is a dedicated underground field laboratory sponsored by the Department of Energy. And they're developing, testing, and accelerating um, breakthroughs in enhanced geothermal system technology to advance uptake in geothermal resources around the world, so not just America. And so, they aim at perfecting the drilling in this location and also stimulation and injection um, for getting the most out of this reservoir. Closer to home in Europe is um, the uh, DEEP project, standing for de-risking enhanced geothermal energy projects. I have this here. Um, some of you may even be on this project. I'm not sure of all of your backgrounds, but I think anybody on, on the IMPROVE project um, has probably heard a lot about geothermal, actually. So. Um, might be preaching to the choir here. Um, and um, they want to de-risk drilling and seismicity and geothermal extraction through real-time mod modeling and risk mitigation strategies. Now, 
Closer to Ireland um, in the UK, there are two currently ongoing geothermal projects that aim at developing geothermal um, heat and electricity to start to power the UK. Um, and they want to do this from the hot granite, granite um, beneath Cornwall. Um, the um, United Dam site in Cornwall um, has currently has two deep directional wells. Um, the production well is 5,275 metres depth, and the injection well for the fluids is at 2,393 metres depth. Another one just down the road from them is the Eden Geothermal um, site. And their aim is to drill a 4.5 uh, kilometer well and heat the Eden project site. You may have seen, I should have put a picture in here, um, these cool biomes um, for greenhouses where they've got lush tropical rainforests in the UK. Um, and they want to um, heat these um, through uh, geothermal power. And once this is established, they'll drill a second well and um, develop an electricity plant to potentially fund electricity at this location too. So let's return to Ireland, because um, that's where I'm from and also Eleanor on the call, um, for, well, the, where we're studying even, um, and return to the temperature gradient map of the world. And what they found interesting um, from this 2018 study was that Ireland has an elevated thermal gradient. Um, I said earlier that it's about 25 degrees Celsius for the continent. Um, and here you can see that the geothermal gradient on this global map Ireland is showing about 45 degrees Celsius. And 32% of Ireland's energy consumption is from heating. And this is mainly from fossil fuels, um, from oil, gas, and peat. Um, yeah. And given that we have these elevated uh, GFL temperature gradients, um, this makes it looks like uh, low enthalpy geothermal systems are a viable option um, in Ireland. And in Dublin, um, at 2.5 kilometers depth, temperatures are expected to be in excess of about 60 degrees Celsius, sufficient for a low enthalpy geothermal system. Um, yeah. However, we've had initial studies of geothermal potential prior to this, um, found a range of temperatures in Ireland. This is a 2.5 kilometer temperature slice from Goodman et al. 2004. And they did find high temperatures, um, but all of these were north of the Iapetus suture zone, a fault zone that kind of crosses um, northeast to southwest across Ireland and extends into uh, Britain. And everything north was quite high, um, and you could see um, significantly elevated temperatures in uh, northern Ireland. But in the south of the island, temperatures at 2.5 kilometers depth were exceptionally low, kind of almost physically impossibly low. However, more recently, um, there's been an updated temperature map from Meta and Year that has been developed. And um, they've modeled um, the temperature across Ireland from known thermal data sets incorporated in their joint modeling scheme and applied paleoclimate corrections to some of the measurements and produced this updated temperature map. So you can see now that temperatures are more evenly distributed across Ireland. Um, all of them are elevated, but um, Northern Ireland is still significantly elevated compared to the rest. So Ireland therefore seems to have a mix of scale for geothermal extraction for heat purposes. At the shallow scale, um, Ireland seems to have um, resources across the whole country and ground source heat pumps are ideally suited to Ireland due to the warm, moist soils and frequent rainfall. Uh, rainfall keeping soil moist year round. And the moisture is um, an essential component um, because it's an excellent heat conductor, allowing heat to move towards the collector system in a ground source heat pump. And it favors the deployment of horizontal collector systems in many parts of Ireland um, to heat homes and businesses. And these are starting to be installed into homes. However, vertical closed loop collectors can also be installed and these require less space, but they'll need to be drilled deeper and are therefore likely to be more costly. And if we have um, productive aquifers in regions, which we're still um, trying to understand, open loop systems are probably more favored than the closed loop systems I showed you before. 
Arnold also has um, recognized potential for deep, low to medium temperature geothermal energy resources suitable for large scale um, district heating and cooling in uh, municipal, residential and industrial areas. And it, geothermal electricity production, it, the Geological Survey of um, Ireland would say that it is possible, and I would agree, um, given what we know. However, the projects may not be economically feasible at this time, and much more research is needed. The temperatures we're getting down to are not 150 degrees C, as you can see um, at this 2.5 kilometers depth map. It's the same at uh, two kilometers even. So it's similar to the one on the previous slide, but just a different color scale. So we're going to be looking at projects for heat purposes, not electricity, but maybe in the future, if we find ways to drill deeper and it's financially viable, this is an option. So Arnold currently has no producing geothermal wells. Um, however, there are multiple past and ongoing geothermal projects at a range of scales and locations. We've had several exploratory research projects and I struggled to find their logos, um, but we have um, the IOTherm project and the GoTherm 3D project, which were looking at um, developing our understanding of thermal properties for the IOTherm, so kind of radiogenic heat production. And GoTherm 3D look, made that original um, temperature map that made the second temperature map that I showed you with the elevated temperatures across Ireland. Uh, the DIG project is also um, at a, is an ongoing project um, that is looking at an all island scale as well as um, a, a basin scale and a local scale project. So it kind of spans all of it and that's ongoing. We also have had the geo urban project which compared um, Dublin to um, a city in Spain and looked at comparisons between the two systems, one high entropy, one low entropy, and the ongoing GeoNorm project, which is based at University College Dublin, um, UCD, where they're hoping to drill a decide on a location of a borehole to extract geothermal energy to heat their UCD campus. And similarly, the Grange Gorman project, um, they've actually had drill to test um, hole down to about a kilometre depth, I think, and um, to ground truth um, temperature estimates of this. And they're hoping to drill um, a new um, borehole in the future um, that will be um, trying to extract uh, geothermal energy. So these two projects are ongoing, as is the DIG project. And these were very much local scale in Dublin. So in this talk, I'll continue to discuss the um, currently happening de-risking Ireland's geothermal potential project. So the primary objective of this multidisciplinary project is to de-risk borehole drilling costs to promote geothermal energy in Ireland. It's all great if you think you've got geothermal potential, but if it's too risky to extract it, then you can't, then it's pointless. So we're going to do this using multidisciplinary massive data sets and um, also develop new state-of-the-art techniques to generate improved geothermal resource maps of Ireland. We've got several objectives for this project. We want to determine the regional geothermal gradient across all of Ireland, and we're gonna use new and existing geophysical, geochemical and petrophysical data sets and use a joint inversion to generate uh, temperature maps of this. And this is at an all Ireland scale as shown by the yellow box. We're then going to go to a um, regional scale approach in the Munster Basin and investigate the thermal chemical crustal structure and secondary fracture porosity within the Munster Basin. We're going to use um, wide angle seismic data, gravity and geochemical data sets. And finally, we're going to move to the local scale um, around focusing around Mallow. Um, and we're going to assess the available low entropy geothermal resource at um, the, the local scale. And we're going to jointly interpret magnetotelluric data, passive seismic modeling results, together with structural geology and hydrochemistry results. So I'm going to give you an overview of all the work packages. Um, the all island approach requires knowledge of the subsurface. And um, in particular, we need to constrain the lithospheric thickness and thermal properties because these have a large control on temperature and the geothermal gradient in the subsurface. Work package one aims to generate new surface wave dispersion maps of Ireland, which I'll show you later, and produce 
a crustal temperature model with uncertainty. I'll come back to this uh, work package later in the presentation because that's my focus of the project. Um, in work package two, we zoom in on the uh, Munster Basin in the southwest of Ireland. Um, and this is um, where we originally had the least petrophysical information, but um, we know it um, has elevated um, thermal potential because of the warm springs in the Mallow area. There are 42 warm springs with an average temperature of 20 degrees Celsius between all of them. So, but we need to know the broader basin scale structure on why these are occurring at Mallow. So um, using, we're going to use um, more gravity data sets, the controlled source profiles, and integrate these together with a joint geophysical uh, petrological modeling scheme. And we're also getting new thermal conductivity results, which I'll explain later in more detail. Um, yeah. Now, what packages three to five all focus on the local scale at Mallow? Um, and this is our demonstration site. And this um, area, as I said, um, has all the warm springs and we're carrying out a magnetotelluric and also a passive seismic data acquisition to image the conduits and pathways supplying the thermal waters to the surface. Now, the resulting um, geophysical models um, will be used as inputs for a 3D structural model for the region and to determine the scale of the geothermal anomaly here. And then it will help us evaluate the local and industrial scale heating um, possibilities for the locality. We also have a hydrochemistry program um, starting in 2023, which will characterize the deep reservoir composition and help identify potential convective pathways and mixing zones. Um, so I'm gonna just go through some of the field work we've done for the DIG project. Um, so this is the pilot MT survey and this was carried out in Mallow with a total of 13 MT stations um, deployed approximately five kilometer long profile here in two phases. And they cross part the key geological features um, shown in here. The white line is kind of our profile, uh, the, the black dots are our profile locations and stuff, but this is the structures that we we're trying to cut across. And it combines um, both old and new um, Phoenix MT systems to record data. And this work is being done by Tao They've also done um, some an additional um, profile across the region um, shown here. And um, but Tao is currently processing the data set for that. So I'll show you the preliminary study first. So the potential culture, we needed to know the cultural noise sources in the Mallow area so that we could remove these um, so that we could actually get the um, structure beneath Mallow. And in this area, we had quite a lot. We had an electric power station, many electric fences because it's agricultural with all farms and also a water pipeline. However, we have a great base remote station near Guggenbarra. It's a very picturesque location, um, not exactly located here but a couple of kilometers down the road and um it's um 100 kilometers away from mallow and help clean up the noisy local station data so we do get to go to some nice scenic places occasionally from time to time so during the data collection we acquire time variations of the electric and magnetic fields and from these time series data we obtain current resistivity phase and responses at each site, providing information on the electrical properties of the shallow and the deep crust. So here we show some of the um, MT data responses um, from some of the northern stations along the profile. And these were processed using um, EM Power, a new generation Phoenix geophysics commercial software. And we removed noisy parts of the data prior to the inversions. But what you're interested in probably is the MT um, tomographic model. And so this is our 2D MT model. It is preliminary at this stage. We need to incorporate it with the other profile and update it. But to first order, it revealed a vertically striking fault conductor at the Kalani Mallow fault zone. So this is the fault in here. And it extends down to maybe a depth of about six kilometers, um, although this is the limits of our resolution. So we're still testing this. But you can see that the fault conductor one here is also located, has fault conductor two. And these match really nicely with the two faults along the profile, which is really cool. Um, 
So yeah, we think that these um, are possibly going to be associated we need to check what these conductive structures are, but they could be associated with fluids or maybe a proxy for a highly fractured or fracture permeable or a high fracture permeability associated with damage around the faults. But this could be something where we could get the um, fluids um, flowing around our potential geothermal site. We also have new publicly available frequency domain airborne EM data. It's an, this is an apparent resistivity map of 3000 Hertz. And the Kalani Malik fault zone on here shows a high conductivity uh, signature at a depth of about 50 meters. And we'll use this to calibrate the shallow structures of the MT model. Um, if I move on to the pilot passive seismic survey, um, in contrast to the MT, we want noise sources. Um, so, which is cool. And so we need um, train noise, such as along the red tracks here. Um, we deployed eight nodal instruments initially, um, located here in an array design, which allowed us to determine the direction of the noise sources so that we could plan a main survey accordingly, which will happen in the coming months. We added uh, three additional arrays of 11 instruments, each around Mallow, and the data analysis confirms the main seismic noise sources and direction for body and surface waves in the area. Um, Maysam is working on this package. And we haven't started the hydrochemistry um, part yet, but that will be starting next year. But let's move back to the all island scale project this is what i work on um so obviously what i'm most interested in and there is a seismic component to this so don't panic too much so um i've mentioned geothermal potential a lot during this presentation but how can we actually map temperature and geothermal gradient here um across um all of Ireland? it's, it's an interesting question so we should probably need to work it out so that we can actually work out geothermal potential for this project. So the most direct measurement that we can do are borehole measurements. And depending on where you're located, this could be excellent and be sufficient for your purposes. However, in Ireland, you can see that we do not have many borehole locations. We have managed to, um, a previous project managed to interpolate this to a surface heat flow map of all of Ireland. And this is a pretty good first order result, but you can see that we have um, gaps in our data sets, but for first order, this is a good first estimate of heat flow um, and then can be used to calculate temperature. Now, size making magnetotelluric imaging can provide complementary information on the thermal structure of the lithosphere. And then we can use geophysical petrological inversion frameworks to extract the temperature information, ultimately improving on some of these models. We can also incorporate other data sets, um, such as topography, potential field data, controlled source seismic models for the crust and improve that. So I'm now going to try and convince you that we need a full lithospheric model rather than solely crustal one to understand geothermal potential. All the depths I've talked about until now have been on the scale of a few kilometers or at most the full crust. But as I mentioned, heat comes from two sources, radio heat production in the crust, but also heat rising from the mantle, which can account for approximately 50% of total heat production. So I'm going to show you in the next few slides, the all Ireland approach showing how constraining lithospheric thickness can provide information on the temperature and geothermal gradient in the subsurface. So to determine lithospheric boundaries, we need seismic data. The map on the right shows all broadband seismic stations, including um, some of the recent deployments that we've had in Ireland, as shown in this map. The red stations are the permanent INSN stations, and the others are more temporary stations, apart from this one BGS map uh, station in um, Northern Ireland. And we utilize the large seismic data sets and extract uh, Rayleigh and Love Wave phase velocity um, dispersion curves measured between pairs of stations. Um, the measurements were performed using two methods with complementary period ranges. We use the teleseismic cross correlation method and the automated multimode waveform inversion method, which gives us um, about a four to 500 second period range for the dispersion curves as shown on the figures on the left. This is from the work of uh, Raffaello Bonadio et al for Rayleigh waves and also for love waves in this study, which is a bit noisier. But that's great that we had it between pairs of stations, but we want to invert those phase velocity dispersion curves um, for phase velocity maps. So we do this using a least squares technique. And here I show the latest Rayleigh and love phase velocity maps. 
um, produced from tens of thousands of dispersion curves, um, creating the highest resolution phase velocity models that we have for the region. Now, I am comparing the same periods, but remember Rayleigh and Love have a non-linear relationship, so um, the sensitivity kernels are not the same. So probably we shouldn't compare them, but for the um, purposes of this presentation, let's just say we can. So broadly, we see differences with slow velocity areas at mantle depths in the uh, Rayleigh models, but these are not present in the Love wave maps, suggesting we have anisotropic fabrics. So we need to account for anisotropy as velocity can change significantly when we invert for absolute shear velocity, increasing uncertainty um, as to whether variations are lithospheric or a result of temperature and anisotropy. For these end so we can use a joint geophysical petrological inversion to get temperature out of these inversions. And here I show some end member models that are not Arlen specific. We use the um, a thermodynamically self-consistent approach known as Winter C, published by Fiyi et al. in uh, GGI in 2021, where seismic velocities, electrical conductivity and density are dependent on mineralogy, temperature, composition, and water content. We obtain geotherms of the crust and lithosphere, where crustal properties and lithospheric thickness affect temperatures in the crust and heat flow. So here I show some end member models, and let's focus on just the um, green profiles. And these are, have exactly the same crustal thickness, exactly the same parameters, but they have different LAB depths. And we can see that at crustal depths, these results, just changing the lithospheric thickness can result in a 10 to 20 Kelvin difference in temperature. So we need to definitely constrain lithospheric thickness, which was not done in the previous um, temperature map of Ireland. We also require information on the thermal properties um, of Ireland for these joint inversions, not just seismic data. So we need um, information on the surface heat flow, as we have from this map. We also require crustal radiogenic heat production, so from the types of rocks, and also thermal conductivity, which we have created as part of um, this study um, in work package two. Um, Note that um, basalts in Northern Ireland do not show up um, very much. This is because we do not have much data for Northern Ireland. So this has all been extrapolated out to Northern Ireland. So we're trying to get more um, data there. Um, I'm gonna skip over how we created the thermal conductivity map in the interest of time um, and show you some of the results of the joint inversion using that information and the seismic stuff that I had. So here are some models for all of Ireland, and these points have been selected because they have the most geophysical data and petrological data at each of these points. And we find that the inversion fitted the Rayleigh and Love Wave dispersion curves really nicely at each of these locations. And this was not a given as the models are inherently non-unique. The inversion um, also generates down to the base of the upper mantle, but for this pro um, presentation, we care about um, kind of lithospheric thickness depths. So we'll look at the upper 200 kilometers. So let's zoom in on some of those maps um, for the shear velocity columns. And we can see variations in the MOHO depths shown here, and also the LAB depths shown here. Now, both boundaries are shallower in the north, going from about 26 kilometers to 35 kilometers. 26 kilometers in about the north to about 35 kilometers depth um, in central and southern Ireland. And the LAB depths um, show sim a similar trend with about 92 kilometers thickness in the north, increasing to about 108 kilometers thick in the south. These models actually have thicker lithosphere than previous models, but it's the first time that high quality surface wave data has been inverted for lithospheric thickness. And it's likely that these are more representative of the LAB depths um, in Ireland and are consistent um, with um, the work of Raffaele Bonadio. We also get anisotropy information and we can see that um, we have some variations, significantly more anisotropy in some of these Northern parameters. So let's look at the temperature columns. Um, we can see that quite a lot of the um, variation can be explained by variations in the um, lithospheric, by mantle heat production variations from the lith changes in the lithospheric thickness. So if we have um, a thinner lithosphere, we have that heat is closer to the surface, therefore we have elevated temperature profiles. 
if it's thicker, then it's um, the heat is further away and we therefore get um, a lower temperature profile. So if red and black in the north where we have um, higher temperature profile, some gradient and um, cooler in the thicker lithosphere. Um, it's, however, this doesn't seem to be the whole story because these red and black lines are significantly more elevated than the rest. And this suggests that we should probably look at the lithology here and maybe a radiogenic um, heat production also plays a role. Um, and it turns out that these are areas that have igneous crustal intrusions. Um, there are some granites in these locations and basalts, um, but the granites look like they're going to be produ producing some um, radiogenic heat production. So we also need to take this into account because this seems to be significant as well. What we also see is, um, and we need to work out how significant this is, we're still refining the models. The green line is Mallow, where I said we had those warm springs. Now, in contrast to um, some of the ones with the thicker lithosphere, you can see that Mallow is slightly elevated, but should have thicker crust. And at um, crustal depths, we see that this is a bit elevated, and more than we'd expect. So maybe if we can understand what is happening at Mallow and why this is slightly um, elevated, this temperature profile, we'll be able to understand, find other locations all across Ireland that are um, useful, that have high, a higher geothermal potential, and we can expand on that. So from these inversions, we can invert point by point for the whole of Ireland. Um, they are all just 1D columns. And once we've inverted for all of these, we can create a full 3D temperature model um, at an increased resolution to the previous temperature models that have been produced. So we've run this on everything, I just need to plot it up, um, usual time constraints. So hopefully if you ever see this work again, then you'll see the final full 3D temperature model. But to conclude, um, for work package one, we've uh, produced surface wave maps for Ireland Britain, and the joint geophysical petrological inversion provides temperature and shear velocity results and reduced uncertainty in the models, building a more accurate temperature model, hopefully in the future, than the one of Matter and Fiyia, because they didn't incorporate the surface wave data um, to constrain lithospheric and moho thicknesses. And we've shown that that is, we need to do this because the temperature models can definitely vary. And um, in the future, for this work package, we need to add additional lithology information and invert for all points across Ireland to make the 3D model. Um, and to conclude the dig specifically, we've got um, five work packages. They're very interdisciplinary and span a range of spatial scales. Um, I won't conclude everything because I'm pretty short on time. So we'll hopefully be able to show you the results for the full um, Field work campaigns in the coming months. And yeah, all five work packages will be integrated at the end to produce a comprehensive overview of the systems with uncertainty and be used to de risk Ireland's geothermal potential. Ultimately, the goal is to reduce the risk associated with borehole drilling for geothermal. So, a quick acknowledgement um, financially supported by the Sustainable Energy Authority. And I'd like to thank GSI for use of their online geothermal resources and also the DIG team for resources for this presentation. So thank you for your time.